so I've been asked uh, in this symposium to talk to you about um, non-surgical management of fractures of the proximal humerus. So proximal humeral fractures are, as you all know, relatively common in terms of our uh, fracture patient population. And conservative management is um, appropriate in the great majority of patients with proximal humeral fractures. So what we want to talk about today, first of all, I'm going to talk to you about what patients are appropriate for conservative treatment, and secondly, how do I apply this conservative treatment. The other speakers are going to talk to you about the surgical management of the patients for whom uh, conservative treatment is inappropriate. Okay? So in order to be successful in managing these fractures, it's important to first of all identify the patient that's appropriate for the treatment that you've selected. Now most proximal humeral fractures are what we call insufficiency fractures. In other words, these are fractures that occur through an area of demineralized or osteoporotic bone. And the three fractures that are most readily identified like this in the uh, appendicular skeleton are the Colley's fracture, the humeral surgical neck fracture, and of course the femoral neck fracture. In the axial skeleton, it's the vertebral compression fracture. So today, we're going to talk about uh, surgical neck fractures. Now, just as an aside, this kind of fracture is a wake-up call for you as an orthopedic surgeon that this patient probably has osteoporosis. So when you see a patient with a surgical neck fracture, you should automatically investigate that patient for the possibility of osteoporosis so they can be treated. And there's a number of papers that outline the importance of using these what we call signal fractures to try and prevent a more serious fracture. So this, uh, this paper in Injury from 2005 talks about the uh, osteoporosis risk assessment and the treatment intervention after hip or shoulder fracture. The idea is you identify the uh, humeral neck fracture. That patient is screened for osteoporosis. If the screening is positive, the patient is treated for osteoporosis in the expectation that we might prevent a subsequent fracture. Now let's look at this the same way as we do with other fracture patients, okay? The age, the gender, the activity level, and the fracture type are all important in decision making around treatment. And 20 year olds and 80 year olds are not treated the same way with any other type of fracture, and so proximal humeral fractures should be considered the same way. We don't treat every proximal humeral fracture the same way. Now the typical patient in my practice is elderly. They're usually well over 70. They're overwhelmingly female as compared to male, and they have a moderate activity level. So these patients are not athletic patients. They're usually not working. They're retired or at home, and they're not physically, they don't do physically demanding work or play physically demanding sports. Now the fracture type's important. Impacted fractures, it doesn't matter to me what the angle of the impacted fracture is, whether they're in varus or valgus, if they're an impacted fracture, they don't need an operation. Okay, I'm going to say that right now. That's a stable fracture. You can treat that fracture conservatively. The patient will have a very satisfactory outcome. Displaced fractures, on the other hand, often require more aggressive treatment, but not necessarily always surgical treatment. Now, the non-surgical treatment, for sure, for any impacted fracture is appropriate. Patients with impacted fractures have a stable fracture. They can start moving their shoulder almost immediately, and they will have a satisfactory outcome. Minimal displacement fractures also have little potential for further displacement. When you see that patient in the emergency department, and they have a minimally or moderately displaced proximal humeral fracture, that displacement will not worsen unless they're treated inappropriately. And so, you don't have to worry about the fracture getting worse because of your treatment, providing your treatment is appropriate. 
Now this is a, a good paper from International Orthopedics, the CCOD Journal uh, from 2004, in which these authors outlined the, uh, the treatment uh, methodology and the results in these proximal humeral fractures. This paper is well worth reading, It'll give you a valuable insight into the approach to this problem. Now the imaging is important. You need an AP shoulder view and a lateral scapular view. Those are the only two views you need for these fractures. Now if you think there is an associated dislocation, which is very rare, but if you think that, an axillary view or if necessary a CT scan will show you whether or not the head's in joint. And this is a typical AP view of a uh, minimally displaced, probably impacted three-part fracture. You can see that the greater tuberosity is a separate fragment on the AP and the transaxillary view. So this is just to show you the degree of displacement and to confirm that the shoulder is in joint. Now the commonest complication of proximal humeral fractures is shoulder stiffness. And therefore the primary goal of conservative treatment is early motion. So if the problem is stiffness, the solution is movement. And so you have to start the shoulder moving almost immediately when you see these patients. And this can be accomplished by, a, first of all, effective pain management. Secondly, a graduated mobilization program so that the patient knows what they're going to do this week, next week, and the week after. And finally, an effective physiotherapy program, which I think can be largely self-delivered. Most of these patients can manage their own exercise program at home. This is also a very good paper. It was in the British Journal, 2003, talking about rehabilitation after two-part fractures. And they have a graduated program, which is very effective. Now, week one, we put these patients in a shoulder immobilizer with minimal restrictions. We tell them, put your arm in the immobilizer, start moving it, use your hand normally, get in the shower, wash. In other words, move your arm around. From the very beginning, we want them to start moving their shoulder. They need appropriate analgesia so that they can do this comfortably. And then we take an x-ray at one week. And what we want to see is no further displacement, occasionally some correction of displacement and displaced fractures, and some inferior subluxation of the humeral head is certainly acceptable because it's a transient phenomenon. Now week two, we start them on pendular exercises. They stay in the shoulder immobilizer, but they lean forward like this, and they do their exercises. So by leaning forward, they're able to abduct their arm and eliminate gravity. And that, that diminishes the amount of discomfort they have and improves their range of motion. The x-ray, the same criteria as week one. Now here's an example of bad treatment. This is a male patient. He's in his uh, mid-60s. He's an alcoholic. This, by the way, if you see this in male patients, high incidence of alcoholism in males that sustain this type of fracture. So here's this fracture. You can see it's an impacted valgus fracture, minimally displaced. He was not treated. He was sent out with a simple collar and cuff sling, no shoulder immobilization, no advice as to how his fracture should be treated. And this is when he came back at week one. And you can see the amount of displacement. This should never happen. And this is why conservative treatment gets a bad reputation, is because he didn't have conservative treatment, he had no treatment, okay? So if you give the patient no treatment, the, the outcome will be poor. If you give them good treatment, the outcome is satisfactory. And here he is uh, after we uh, pulled on his arm a little bit to straighten it out again. So week three, now they start doing the same exercises, but out of the sling, shoulder flexion with support, put your arm under like that, get them to lift their arm up. No active abduction, but assisted abduction with physiotherapy. And then week four, now we start going. The fracture is sticky, well advanced in healing, 
So active shoulder flexion and abduction, some assisted external rotation, x-ray to make sure that their fracture is healed, and begin activities of daily living specific to shoulder function. So get them reaching up, starting to reach up, comb their hair, wash their face, that kind of thing. Week six, we take away all the support. We're on a fully active program then and start a muscle strengthening and get them back to doing light, light uh, housekeeping. And then week seven to 12, active physiotherapy, muscle strengthening, and increase their activity of daily living. So this is a program. This isn't just, you don't say to them, well, you've gone off when you're sling now and come back and see me next week. You put them in their shoulder immobilizer and you start their exercise program <clears throat> and you keep them going the whole time. And here's the anticipated outcome. Fractures healed, shoulders and joint, no metal, no scar. Now the results are often disappointing because the range of motion is diminished, they often have some discomfort, and they often have decreased function. The problem is that the surgical results are just the same. And you cannot improve on the outcome for these patients with an operation if you start off with a 70-year-old woman <coughs> with a minimally displaced proximal humerus fracture. This is a, a, a good paper from the, the Bulletin for the Hospital for Joint Diseases outlining the uh, incidence of unnecessary surgery in their patient population. So a combination of inability to fully participate in mobilization programs plus an adequate surgical fixation is responsible for the lack of superiority of surgical treatment. And this is a great review <coughs> from the people in Switzerland and in Edinburgh about the outcome of 507 minimally displaced fractures of the proximal humerus that clearly showed that surgical treatment for these patients is inferior to conservative treatment. So the philosophy of rigid fixation with increased early mobilization does not seem to apply to proximal humeral fractures in the osteoporotic patient, and you're going to hear my colleagues talk to you about this in a minute. These are two recent papers. I think you should read them both. This first paper is a randomized trial of angular stable plate fixation compared to non-surgical treatment in elderly patients. The results for non-surgical treatment were superior. And the second paper is hemiarthroplasty for the four-part fractures in patients over 65. Again, the results from surgery were no better than the results of conservative treatment. So in summary, remember the fracture type is important. Not all humeral fractures are the same. Secondly, they need a staged mobilization program. Third, a regular follow-up to measure progress. You don't send these people home and say, come back and see me in a month. You need an early reintroduction to activities of daily living so that these people can start using their arm normally. And you need a realistic goal for you and the patient. Finally, two papers you must read if you're going to treat humeral fractures. The first is by uh, Anglin from uh, the U.S on avoiding complications in the treatment of humeral fractures. And the second is by Murray, proximal humeral fractures, current concepts and classification, treatment and outcomes. It will nicely encapsulate for you where we are with this type of fracture problem. Thank you. <clears throat>